All right, today is John chapter 3. And remember, these are not chronological order. John's skipping around. John's not giving us like the, the storyline of Jesus' life. John is giving us some of the key moments of Jesus' life. So in this chapter, we're going to learn the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus and understand this a little bit better. Verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, this is important. If it's one thing we can learn from this chapter, as a, if we had a theme for this chapter, is Jesus can handle the heights of wisdom. He is super smart. He understands things. Okay, now verse 1, we hear of Nicodemus. So he is a man of the Pharisees, a ruler of the Jews. Uh, the New Testament study manual says, as a member of the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus occupied a position of political, social, and religious influence and power. From other scriptures, we learn that Nicodemus appears to have been sincere in the question he asked Jesus. For example, Nicodemus spoke in defense of the Savior to the chief priests and Pharisees, for which he was ridiculed. After the Savior's crucifixion, Nicodemus assisted Joseph of Arimathea in burying the Lord's body, contributing expensive burial ointments and spices. So this is really interesting. Nicodemus is a man who is a major leader in the Sanhedrin. Lots of respect, lots of power and authority, but he is perplexed by this Jesus person. And it looks as if, we don't hear necessarily Nicodemus have a divine, like, he is to Christ, I need to renounce what I, you know, the being a Pharisee and stuff and follow Christ. But he sees something, he recognizes something. And at what point he does, does Nicodemus convert to Christ, become a disciple of Christ? We don't know. Uh, but uh, it'll be interesting to see if we learn more. Um, but we see that, that Nicodemus treats Christ in a very different way than a lot of the Sadducees and Pharisees do. And it's interesting, in the, in the TV show The Chosen, they use the story of Mary as part of this idea to shake Nicodemus. And maybe that's ha what happens, most likely not, but there's, for some reason, Nicodemus is not set on the same ment mental ideas as the rest of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Because they, every time they confront Jesus, they preserve their power. They see him as a threat to their power. Nicodemus, where Jesus is clearly a threat to Nicodemus's power and, and social status, Nicodemus is interested in Christ and tries to defend Christ to the Sanhedrin. So we see Nicodemus isn't so worried about losing power as he is finding the truth. So really interesting perspective we get here. Uh, now Nicodemus's name means the people are victorious, and it's a Greek name, okay? Which is interesting because he's Jewish. He's a Jewish leader, but his 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 Greek name Nicodemus. Basically, really interesting. Uh, verse two. Then let's see. Oh, sorry. The same came to Jesus by night, and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. So here's what's interesting about this, okay? He's coming in the nighttime. So that could mean that Nicodemus is trying to come to Jesus when nobody else would see Nicodemus coming to Jesus. So that could be true. He wants to sneak in, talk to Jesus, because if everybody saw him coming to Jesus, he would be ridiculed among the Sanhedrin and his, his peers. Uh, but he asks him, he says in here, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. So they're using evidence to understand Jesus. So Nicodemus is going, I don't know who you are, but the only way you could be doing what you're doing is if God is with you. So I'm trying to understand why is God with you? So he's he's trying to wrap his brain around this. He's acknowledging Christ is doing miracles, and the only way miracles can be done is through the power of God, so he must have the power of God. But why does he have the power of God to do this versus the Sanhedrin or others, or even Nicodemus himself? So he's got these conflicting ideas that are going on, these challenges, and he's, he's weighing them against each other. The rest of the Pharisees, if you notice, 
they saw these conflictions and they devalued that there, there's got to, Oh, it was the devil. He used devil power to do it. That wasn't God's power. He used devil's power because I have the power of God. So I, he can't, he can't have the same power as me. Do you see how that shifts? Nicodemus is looking at this going, he does miracles. The power of God is how miracles are done. Therefore he must have the power of God. Why does he have the power of God? What is going on? He's not a part of the Sanhedrin. He's not, he's not come up through the normal ranks. Why does he have some power that he shouldn't have it? But what's going on? So do you see how the different assumptions are made between the Pharisees and Nicodemus? He's thinking different. And that's an important thing for us to look at. Okay. So the other thing to look at this, this is the interesting thing is uh, when he says, except God be with him. This is really interesting because when we think of this idea, that is the word Emmanuel. God is with me. That's one of the other names for Christ, the great Emmanuel. God is with him. Really cool that he kind of used that in there. Uh, now verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So uh, uh, this is really interesting. Now, uh, again, can also mean from above in Greek. So instead of a man be born again, this is the, a, a lot of Protestantism uses that term born again. And this is where they get it from right here. Except a man be born again. Okay. But in the Greek, the word again can mean above. It's used this way several more times in John 2, thus showing it is most likely this, this, the same for this verse as well. Except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Could be another way to think about this. So again, unless you are doing spiritual things, you are spiritual, you're, you're thinking spiritually, you won't discern and understand. So if you're thinking using worldly philosophy in terms, you won't understand spiritual things. You have to see it through the spiritual lens to understand the kingdom of God, basically. So that's basically what he says here. Now, Nicodemus sees this and says, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So again, Nicodemus is looking a little more literally, worldly on this. And Christ basically just, just told him, you got to think spiritual to understand this stuff. And he hasn't caught on yet. No, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So he's there's a clarification there. In Mark 1, the beginning of Mark, he's, there's a lot of similarities in this as well. 7 and 8, being, being born again, doing these things, that's the, your baptism and stuff. So born of water and of the Spirit. So baptism. John the Baptist talked about being baptizing of water, but somebody else will come and baptize of the Holy Ghost or of fire. That is the Spirit. So baptism of water, baptism of fire. You have to do both. So here's what's fascinating about that is baptism of water is an ordinance. It can be done. It is outward. Everyone can see when you do it. Baptism by fire, no one will see that happen. That is between you and God. So can you be baptized and not have the baptism of fire with you? Yeah. Can it take time after your baptism to feel that baptism of fire, to have that conversion done? Yes, it can. So realize that even if you were baptized, I know like in the LDS church, you're baptized around the age of eight if you're born into an active LDS family. But a lot of people complain about that, saying that it's too early. The kids don't understand you know, I was born at eight, but I didn't really understand what I was doing. I just went through the motions and things. Well, the baptism is one part of water, but then there's the baptism of fire that has to happen too. And that's the testimony of Jesus Christ. You need to have that too. Everybody, whether you are born into a family that's active or not, or a convert later, you have to have that testimony. That's the baptism of fire. Now, can you, in a way, have that baptism of fire before your baptism by water? Can you have a testimony of Christ before then? You can. But when the Holy Ghost has come after baptism, you have a stronger, even greater testimony of Christ. And so that's, that's important how this works out, basically. 
So this is important for us to be, to, you know, this is, again, Christ is trying to explain, you need to be converted. You need to be converted. Okay, this is the doctrine of Christ. That's what this means, basically. So this is important for us to think about, is the, the doctrine. Okay, when we think of the doctrine of Christ, this is the article of faith number four for the LDS people, faith, faith, repentance, baptism, and the Holy Ghost. The doctrine of Christ is what that's called. That's what verse five is, basically, is this. You, if you want to go to heaven, you need to come this way. You need to go this direction, basically. So verse six, that which is born of the flesh and that which is born of the spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So this is really interesting. Again, he's like, don't, you know, don't be so confused about this. Um, in fact, uh, in uh, Le Grand Richard's book, A Marvelous Work and a Wonder, he says, this has been interpreted to mean that the Spirit of the Holy Ghost comes and goes at will without any doing of ours at, or the performance of any ceremony, such as a laying on of hands. What he, he's going to, he, as he's talking, this is what he's, so Nicodemus is still confused. Okay. And, Jesus like, don't, you know, let's, let me help you understand this better, okay? So, the verse 8, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. So he's explaining, this is the, the being born of the Spirit idea. And as uh, LeGrand Richards is pointing out, that some people think, this means the Spirit comes and goes as the Spirit pleases, and we don't have any control over that. He says, There is no justification for such interpretation in the light of many scriptural passages to the contrary already referred to. True it is that we cannot see the Spirit come or go, and more than we can see, any more than we can see the wind, even though we can hear its sound and feel its movement. But when the Holy Ghost is conferred upon us by the laying on of hands by one having authority, even though he cannot be seen by the mortal eye, his workings are discernible in the life and conduct of the worthy recipient. So when we are bestowed, to have the Holy Ghost bestowed upon us after baptism, the confirmation part, basically, we have the opportunity to have the Holy Ghost with us more. So we take the testimony uh, the Holy Ghost gives us before we're born, or before we're, before we're baptized, excuse me, then we get through the baptism and then the conversion we get a stronger testimony through the Holy Ghost now that he's with us more. So that conversion is important. That's the key theme. Be converted to Christ. Very, very important for everyone to do. Regardless of religion, regardless of church you belong to, be converted to Christ. Single most important thing you can be doing. Follow Christ. The more you follow Christ truthfully, the more truth you'll find and the more you'll find your way to where you need to be. Very important for us to understand. Uh, now, verse 9, Nicodemus comes back and he says, uh, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? You realize Nicodemus is like a scholar of scholars. Like everybody wants to listen to Nicodemus because he is, he's at the, he's the, at the top of the list at scholarship for, for Jewish philosophy and, and ideas. And Jesus is schooling him. At understanding. Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about here? How can this be? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? So he, he's kind of like, aren't you one of the head people and you don't you don't understand this stuff? Verse 11, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. Now, this is really interesting uh, because in the Greek, Greek construction suggests that verses 11 through 21 contain a direct quotation. This testimony of Jesus was given to a member of the Sanhedrin, basically. That's, this is an interesting idea to look at, okay? So he's, he's testifying. He's saying, you know, he, this is in verse 11, we speak that we know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. So we're telling you the truth, but you're not believing it. 
Verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? So he's like, look, if I told you things of this world and you still don't believe me, what good is it going to do to teach you the grander mysteries of heaven? Because if you don't believe the things that matter to this world and relate to our world, the stuff that relates to heaven, you're not going to get. This is That's going to be way over your head. Uh, verse 13, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now, this is interesting. Think of John 1, okay, the Word was made flesh. Christ is the one who is bringing heaven to earth. No other man has done this. That's what this is. Christ is bringing heaven to earth. Basically, he's bringing that together. Verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So Christ is trying to help Nicodemus connect the dots between prophecies and himself. Not just talking about about conversion process, the importance of being converted. It's not enough to just follow the law. You have to be converted. Remember, the, the law of Moses, just obey the rules is all you have to do is what they believe. Salvation by works, basically, is what the Jews believed. You follow the law, and that's it. The law saves you. So you don't need to think about it. Just do what the law tells you to do. And Christ is telling Nicodemus, no, follow the law is good, but you have to be converted. You have to have a testimony of Jesus Christ, of the divinity. You have to be converted. And this is important. Baptism and the Holy Ghost are the important parts. And that's what he's not getting because that doesn't make sense with the law of Moses. And so now he's trying to connect these dots. So... Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness. If you remember that story, the people were sick. Poisonous serpents were coming out and biting the people, and they were all sick, and some were dying. And so Moses was told to create a symbol for people to look at. Now, a lot of times we hear this symbol as a rod with a snake wrapped around it, a brazen snake wrapped around it, uh, which is oftentimes equated to the symbol of modern medicine the staff with the snake wrapped around it for healing, a symbol of healing that we get. A lot of scholars, and you can go back and watch our videos on this in the Old Testament, but what a lot of scholars believe that happened was there was a, a staff, a pole, and they took a snake and they nailed it to the pole. So it looked more like a cross, basically. And those who looked upon the cross... The Savior, the symbol of the Savior's atonement, his death and you know, and all the, the things he suffered for us would be saved. So it was metaphorical back then, and what he's saying, he, so he's trying to say, Nicodemus, let's connect some of these Old Testament dots. You know the Old Testament, let's connect some dots here for you. Verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Just as the people who believed on the Symbol, if I look at the symbol, I will live. If I follow the Son of God, Christ, I will have eternal life, not just the physical life. And then the great John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How wonderful this is. Now, what's interesting is this can also be translated as the unique son rather than the only begotten son. We talked about that uh, earlier in John chapter 1. Many scholars think it's the unique son is the more original translation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only unique son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's, a lot of scholars think that's more of the appropriate way to say it. Uh, now, uh, in the Sperry Symp- Symposium Classics New Testament about John the Beloved, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said this. He called perhaps the most powerful single verse of Scripture ever uttered, John 3.16. Uh, John the Beloved testified, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That single verse that Elder McConkie summarizes the whole plan of salvation, tying together the Father, the Son, His atoning sacrifice, that belief in Him which presupposes righteous works, 
and ultimate eternal exaltation for the faithful. It's all pulled together in one verse. So succinct. It's so great. It is through Jesus Christ that we go to the Father, basically. Verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, Joseph Smith adds a little bit to this verse here in his translation. He says, The Son of God, which before was preached by the mouth of the holy prophets, for they testified of me. So he Joseph Smith's translation adds a, a little piece in there at the end, saying that the, the prophets in the Old Testament testified that I would come. Remember, he's talking, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He is, Jesus is laying out the doctrines and teachings of his gospel in a way he doesn't with anybody else. And he's doing this with Nicodemus. So remember that. This is, this is really profound. Uh, in fact, uh, Doctrines of Salvation, Joseph uh, Fielding Smith said, I believe firmly that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of, the God, of God in the flesh. He taught this doctrine to his disciples. He did not teach them that he was the Son of the Holy Ghost, if it was through this power that Jesus was brought into this world, but not as the Holy Son of the Ghost, Holy Son of, not as the Son of the Holy Ghost, but as the Son of God. Jesus is greater than the Holy Spirit, which is subject to him, but his Father is greater than he, he has said, Christ was begotten of God. He was not born without the aid of man, and that man was God. So that was a really interesting testimony that Joseph Fielding Smith gave of, of God as well. Uh, now continuing on, verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. This is that idea we've talked about of finding truth. Okay, Why do you hate the truth? If you take what you know and what you've just learned and make them equal, you have to understand that one of these might not be completely true and you have to be willing to give up your truth. If you don't, just as it says here, everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Why do they avoid it? I don't want to learn all this because I just want to reinforce what I know. Because if I learn more truth, what I know might not be true. And I'm going to have to change this. This is finding truth. That's what he's talking about here. So people who are having problems and challenges, they're not, they need repentance in their life. They're not learning truth. You need to keep learning, and which is admitting that what you currently know might not be 100% true. That's the only way to find truth. You can't curiously find the truth of things. You have to be willing to understand that I need to change. I need to change, not them. I need to change in order to learn truth. That's what he's saying. Verse 21, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Again, this is the idea of truth. I need to take I need to be willing to give up what I know now if I to learn new truth because maybe what I know now is a little true but not all the way true. To get more of the truth I have to be willing to give up what I know now. That's this journey of finding more truth. Verse 22 After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea and there he tarried with them and baptized. So the the Discussion with Nicodemus is done. And now they've moved to Judea. Uh, they've gone over to the land of Judea. And he, there he tarried with them and baptized. So Jesus is baptizing people. That's verse 22. Verse 23, And John was also baptizing in Aion. Now we don't know where this place is. Uh, near to Salim because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. So John the baptizer, John the Baptist, was still baptizing people, and now Jesus is baptizing people too. Uh, verse 24, for John was not yet cast into prison. Uh, verse 25, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples about Jews and the Jews about purifying. So now there's this question, what about this purification stuff? 
Verse 26, And they came unto John, and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come unto him. Uh, Joseph Smith translation actually adjusts that last line. It says, And he receiveth of all people who come unto him. Uh, verse 27, And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath made the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. So this is, uh, sorry, itchy nose. This is John, again, testifying of Jesus. And they're going, but Jesus is baptizing. So what's, what does this mean? And he says, that's fine. We're doing the same baptism, but he's got more. I'm here to prepare you to accept him. It's time for me to lessen what I'm doing to allow him to be in the main view of everybody. So there's not a, there's not, we're not contradicting each other. We're not competing for followers. I'm going to lessen my ministry to encourage you to go to his ministry, basically. That's, that's important. Very important for us to think about. So let's see. Uh, verse 31, he that cometh from above is above all, and he that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth, he that cometh from heaven is above all. So testifying, Christ came from heaven, he is the Son of God, he's more important. Verse 32, and what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, no man can receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. Now, this is, this is interesting. In verse 32 and verse 33, he, they're talking about, again, testimony of God. You have to have this testimony of Christ. You need to have a belief in him. This testimony is important. Uh, he's not saying that no one has a testimony of Christ. He's saying that it is important that we do. You have to do this. If you have a testimony, then that is important. You need to focus on having that testimony, okay? He that receiveth his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. If you believe in Jesus, you will believe in God. They come together. Verse 34, For he whom God hath speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son hath shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Joseph Smith adjusts this last verse as well and says, uh, or verse 34, excuse me, and says, For God giveth him not the Spirit by measure, for he dwelleth in him even the fullness. And then verse 36, Joseph Smith changes that one a little bit as well and says, And he who believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and shall receive of his fullness. But he who believeth not the Son shall not receive of his fullness, for the wrath of God is upon him. So this, again, testimony of Jesus Christ is supremely important for our, for our life. We need to be focusing on having and growing our testimony of Jesus. More than anything out there, be building up your testimony of Jesus. That relationship with him is supremely important. And we need to be focusing on that. That's an important thing for us to do. Regardless of anything else you learn about church, focus on testimony of Jesus Christ. A personal testimony testimony you have that he lives, that he is your God and your Savior. He is the Messiah. He is there for you. His atonement is there to help you and bless you. That's what you need to focus on the most. Keep focusing on that. Don't get distracted by who did what or, or weird doctrines or philosophies or ideas. Focus on Jesus Christ and getting to know him first. When you know him, then you can handle the rest of it. Because you'll see more of the truth around the rest of it. But focus on him first. Thanks for watching. Hope you guys are enjoying these videos. And uh, like and subscribe to the video. Like and subscribe to our channel as well. And we'll see you in the next one.